take up the intelligence authorization bill. Also, highway programs today and the military construction veterans affairs bill. That's coming up later this afternoon. Now live to the House floor here on C-SPAN. The House will be in order. And the prayer will be offered today by Rabbi Aaron Melman, uh, Congregation Beth Shalom, Northbrook, Illinois. We invoke the blessing of Almighty God upon the members of this House. Bless our leaders and all who work tirelessly for the good of our people with an understanding and discerning mind, a listening ear, a compassionate heart, and insightful thoughts. Bless the people of the United States of America. Help us to gain the insight to know what is good and true, for it is through your spirit and love that we learn to become more human. We thank you for enabling us to live in a free country, and we remember those who do not yet live with the same freedoms. We pray that the leaders of our nation help all those who are in need. Shield our leaders and bless them. Protect our armed forces and speed our victory over tyranny. Let us make each day more meaningful, helping others move towards a life of peace. 
May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. The Chair has examined the Journal of the Last Day's Proceedings and announces to the House his approval thereof. Pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the Journal stands approved. Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Dold. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, without objection, uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Dold, is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud to welcome my friend, Rabbi Aaron Melman, who delivered the opening prayer this morning. Rabbi Melman has served the families of Congregation Beth Shalom in Northbrook, Illinois, for the past nine years, where he works with children and adults to help them better develop their faith. Previously, he studied and taught in New York City, where he served as a student chaplain to the New York City Fire Department. On September 12, 2001, he found a way to get to ground zero, and thereafter provide comfort and support to those first responders in need. Rabbi Melman is devoted to helping others. He serves as the president of the Chicago region of the Rabbinical Assembly. He provides valued education to families through his work as a board member for the Chicago Center for Jewish Genetic Disorders, and he continues to support firefighters by serving as the chaplain to the Northbrook Fire Department. Mr. Speaker, I'm honored to call Rabbi Melman my friend. Before I yield, I do want to also, congratulate Rabbi Melman and his bride, Elisa, on their 13th wedding anniversary, which they celebrated last night. We certainly appreciate you joining us and celebrating uh, that with us today. With that, I yield back. The chair will entertain 15 further requests for one-minute speeches on each side of the aisle. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Question and answer consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, my congressional district is in southeast Texas, right in Hurricane Alley. When Katrina, Rita, Humbert, Gustav, and Ike all struck with their fury, people were left in the dark with no internet or cell service. But local TV and radio reporters were still on the air telling folks what they needed to know. Hurricane Rita was the fourth most intense Atlantic hurricane ever recorded and the most intense hurricane ever observed in the Gulf of Mexico. The storm was devastating to our communities, but many folks were able to stay safe because they were turned in or tuned in to the news. Our broadcasters provide communities with vital life-saving information before and after storms. They are the most reliable resource we have when disaster strikes. Today, on the first day of hurricane season, we should thank all of our local first responders, police, and firefighters. But we should also thank all the broadcasters who do their part to keep us safe in southeast Texas when the storms come crashing ashore. And that's just the way it is. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio rise? Mr. Speaker, I request permission to address the House for one minute. Without objection. Gore Vidal called it perpetual war for perpetual peace. The administration's unrestricted use of drones has taken us into undeclared wars in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Sudan, and who knows where else, destroying not only alleged militants, but making a direct hit on international law and the U.S. Constitution. Drone strikes are killing militants now identified as males of fighting age. What are the rules? Trust us. What are the legal justifications? Trust us. Haven't 350 civilians been killed? Innocents? Trust us, we're told. No transparency, no accountability, and until now, no Congress. The Constitution requires Congress to weigh in and demand information and legal justification drone strikes. That's my letter to the administration seeks. Drone strikes, absent a constitutional basis, sanctions the wholesale slaughter of innocents. One nation's drones over another nation's airspace is an act of war. With 50 nations exploring the development of drones, a $100 billion business, we cannot permit this nation to further incite perpetual war for perpetual peace. For what purpose does the gentleman from Indiana rise? Mr. Speaker, I request unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Would advise me to my remarks. Without objection. 
Mr. Speaker, I rise today to talk about the important work of our broadcast radio stations in emergency situations. Back in March, a violent tornado ripped through a 49-mile stretch of our southern Indiana district. It leveled entire towns, did millions of dollars in damage, and took numerous lives. The death toll probably would have been higher were it not for the early warnings to seek shelter so many received by radio. In the aftermath of the storm, with no power or TV or Internet and virtually no cell service, radio instructed Hoosiers where to find first aid, food, and shelter. So I'd like to thank our broadcasters today for the valuable service they provide. In the midst of chaotic set situations, it is our nation's radio broadcasters who provide needed direction. Thank you, and I yield back. What purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, after a lifetime of service to our nation, American seniors deserve a secured retirement, a strong Medicare, and Social Security safety net. Sadly, the House Republicans are choosing to give a tax break to millionaires and billionaires over paying for Medicare. The GOP budget will give those already making over $1 million a year an average tax cut of 394000 all told, the Republican budget gives away, I state, gives away $3 trillion in tax breaks to big oil companies that ship jobs overseas and the ultra-rich, and that does not reduce the deficit. That is wrong. We should be giving a tax break to hardworking middle-class families, small businesses, and not the wealthiest few. We must end the tax cut, the Bush tax cut, for the rich. No new taxes, no new jobs. No new taxes, no new jobs. Let's work together on a bipartisan budget plan that protects Medicare and makes all Americans pay their fair share. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina rise? Without objection, gentleman for Mr. Speaker, tomorrow marks the official first day of hurricane season. Each year, South Carolinians remain alert from June through the summer hoping another Hurricane Gracie, Hugo, or Andrew does not reach our beaches, bringing massive destruction. During times of emergency, radio and television stations have proven themselves as the most reliable source by being the first to promote important, life-saving, and time-sensitive information. When disaster strikes, these broadcast networks are still available. I am grateful for each of these services and look forward to working with our National Guard led by Adjutant General Bob Livingston and Emergency Management Director George McKinney II. In addition, I would like to welcome the group of foster young adults who are visiting today, including Jasmine Thompson of Washington. I appreciate, I appreciate each of you sharing your challenges with us, and we look forward to hearing of your success in the future. In conclusion, God bless our troops, and we'll never forget September 11th and the global war on terrorism. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Ohio rise? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today I rise on behalf of the women who are part of the fabric of our nation's workforce. Nationally, women working full time are paid 77 cents for every dollar paid to men. These disparities are even worse for women of color. In Ohio, my home state, African American women are paid only 62 cents and Hispanic American women only 54 cents for every dollar paid to white males. The gender wage gap not only hurts women, unfair wages hurt entire families. In nearly two out of three American families, a woman is either the breadwinner or co-breadwinner of their household. That means if women are not paid fairly, many families will not get fed. I co-sponsored the Paycheck Fairness Act because I cannot and will not stand by as pay disparities persist. Gender discrimination is shameless and intolerable, and it must be stopped. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Missouri rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute to rise, without rise and extend my remarks. Without objection, gentleman Rector. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When a weather emergency strikes, local radio and television stations play an instrumental role in keeping families informed on vital warnings and emergency response efforts. A little over one year ago, the city of Joplin, Missouri was changed forever when an EF-5 tornado struck. 
local radio stations like KZRG, the Zimmer Radio Group, Community Radio Group, and KDMO provided Joplin residents with critical information as it was happening. After the tornado, they helped families locate their loved ones and provide information on where they could seek shelter and food. Local stations are a tremendous asset to their communities, especially during weather emergencies. These stations keep their communities informed on the latest weather conditions and provide support after the storms pass. I want to thank all the local radio and TV stations across the country, especially those in the Joplin area, for the great public service they provide their communities before, during, and after these weather emergencies. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Connecticut rise? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like so many of us, I got back from 10 days in my district and the constant question of why can't Congress come together to get some things done? And I was thinking about that because the Republican majority says we passed the Violence Against Women's Act. We uh, passed an extension of the lower student interest rate bill. But when you look at those bills, you really got to scratch your head. The Violence Against Women Act that they passed was opposed by not dozens, but by hundreds of women's organizations. Let me say that again a Violence Against Women Act that was opposed by women's organizations from one coast to the other. I say all this not to strike partisan points, but because on July 1st, student loan interest rates double, putting $1,000 of additional cost on each and every student in this country. The Republicans said, let's pay for that by removing preventive health care. To my mind, health care and education are what creates jobs. It is time for this institution to act intelligently and help the true job creators in this country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kansas rise? Mr. Speaker, I request the unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, now, just a few days after Memorial Day, I rise in support of a new resolution introduced by Mr. Gingry to honor America's Patriot Guard writers. Uh, the Patriot Guard started in August of 2005 in Mulvane, Kansas, in the southern part of the district which I represent, with a group of folks from local one, VFW Post 136, and it now numbers over 220,000 patriotic Americans. These great Patriot Guard riders attend funerals and protect the families from unwanted intrusion during this important time when these service members have fallen. Uh, they visit veterans in hospitals and meet, uh, meet with the family members of these soldiers, and they contribute their time and their dollars to scholarships for the families of American fallen soldiers. I urge my colleagues to join me in co-sponsoring Mr. Gingrey's resolution, HRS 669, and in honoring this group of patriotic Americans known as our patriot writers. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Texas rise? The gentlewoman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, we are faced with a number of challenges. I've lived through Hurricane Rita, Katrina, Ike, Storm Allison, and I realize the importance of emergency radio and television giving us the information as a lifeline. And I want to thank Charity Productions going on right in my district right now, the sixth annual Ecumenical Hurricane Forum. Thank you so very much for educating our public. I also wanted to rise today to congratulate the CNBC and the Congressional Black Caucus Faith Forum that has been going on for the last two days. We realize that America's faith institutions, and in this instance, African American denominations, are crucial coming together to reach out for empowerment, for social justice, and certainly freedom. We thank them so much for the work that they do. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, let me say that in this particular body and in the Judiciary Committee, we're facing the question of Pfizer and the uh, impact of uh, the uh, Pfizer amendments as it has reversible impact on spying on Americans. We must look to get the data and insist that we're securing the homeland, but we must also ensure that Americans are not, in essence, spied upon, are not surveilled uh, by the impact of international uh, needs. I thank the speaker and I yield back my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Indiana rise? The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On May 18, 2012, Sergeant Gibran Knox from Auburn, Indiana, died at the age of 23 of injuries sustained when his unit received indirect fire in the Kunar province in Afghanistan. Sergeant Knox joined the Army in January 2009 
and reported to Joint Base Lewis McCord, Washington, and was assigned to 1st Battalion, 377th Field Artillery Regiment, 17th Fires Brigade in June 2009. Within a month, Sergeant Knox was deployed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom until May 2010. His unit was then deployed in support of Operation Enduring Freedom in November 2011. Sergeant Knox's awards and decorations include the Army Achievement Medal, Meritorious Unit Citation, Army Good Conduct Medal, National Defense Service Medal, Iraq Campaign Medal, Afghanistan Campaign Medal, and the Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, NCO Professional Development Ribbon, Army Service Ribbon, Overseas Ribbon, and the Marksmanship Qualification Badge. Sergeant Knox and his wife Courtney married on November, two, on November 9, 2009, in the middle of his deployment to Iraq. Their first child, Braylon, was born October 17, 2011, just two weeks before Sergeant Knox was deployed to Afghanistan. Sergeant Knox selflessly gave his life as a service to defend our country's freedom in support of both Ara Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. My heart goes out to his family, and I want to express my gratitude to them both for the service they have made for our nation. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Massachusetts rise? The the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, during this Congress, we have seen numerous bills that would reverse decades of progress for women's health. Today, we take our ninth such floor vote. We have seen H.R. 358, which permits hospitals and hospital workers to choose to deny women care that would save their lives, putting ideology above all. We have seen H.R. 3, a bill that would cause insurers to start refusing to cover a legal and safe procedure. We have seen bills that would restrict women's access to preventative care and efforts to eliminate all funding for the only federal program dedicated to providing comprehensive family planning services. At home, our constituents are pleading for us to focus on job creation, but here we are again today about to debate H.R. 3541, yet another ideologically driven bill that intrudes on the relationship between a woman and her doctor. In particular, this bill puts doctors in situations where they could be forced to report confidential, confidential conversations with women to law enforcement. Let's reject H.R. 3541 and start looking at bills that can solve problems for women. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida rise? The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, June 1st marks the start of another Atlantic hurricane season. The time to prepare for hurricanes or any natural disaster is now. The federal government, led by FEMA, is gearing up to respond to hurricanes that may impact the United States and is working with state and local emergency management officials, first responders, and nonprofit partners to make sure all are prepared. The private sector also plays a vital role by preparing the, their businesses and often donating goods and services to response and relief efforts. Broadcasters and wireless providers work to ensure communication systems are up and running to provide vital information during an emergency. We all play a role in preparedness and I urge Americans to pledge to prepare. Put together an emergency kit, develop a family plan, uh, encourage others to prepare. Taking those steps now can make a huge difference should disaster strike. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts rise? The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. During the last two months, students from my district have spoken out about their struggles to afford college, to pay their loans, to keep up their grades, to maintain their jobs. Many of them are working multiple jobs and still graduating with twenty to thirty thousand dollars in debt and it's way too much for them. So now they're just watching as the days tick by and we're getting closer to July 1st when student loan interest rates will actually double if Congress doesn't act. They're understandably scared and they're frustrated. At Middlesex Community College recently the students that I met with added their voices to the debate and signed their names on the wall of debt. In the days following, hundreds of students, parents, and even grandparents added their names to what has now become the world virtual wall of debt. They're letting Congress know that we can't let those interest rates double on July 1st. 
So again, I'm standing here today on behalf of 177,000 students in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, 7 million students across the country whose student loan rates are set to double if Congress doesn't act. I call upon my Republican colleagues to put the partisanship and the political gains aside and take real action on this important issue. Well, I believe the bill that I put forward a month ago to prevent the interest rate from doubling to 6.8 percent and was fully paid by just one tax subsidy to big oil was fair and reasonable. I continue to be open to find other ways to compensate for that bill. I urge my colleagues to join me in doing that and make sure that this interest rate does not double. Has expired. For what purpose does the gentlelady from North Carolina rise? I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute, Mr. Speaker. Gentlewoman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, in 2009, the Obama administration said unemployment would never reach 8 percent if the stimulus was approved. Three years and $1.2 trillion in spending later, unemployment has remained above 8 percent for 39 consecutive months, the longest span since the Great Depression. Even more alarming is that 8 percent doesn't illustrate how grim the situation really is. More than half a million Americans are out of work since President Obama took office, and currently the percentage of working Americans is at a 30-year low. Unemployment would be 40 percent higher if more Americans hadn't given up looking for jobs. With these numbers, it is clear that President Obama's policies have failed and are making the economy worse. House Republicans have a plan for America's job creators to help turn this economy around. It's time for the President and Senate Democrats to stop blocking our jobs bill and help us put Americans back to work. I yield back. For what purpose does gentlewoman from Oregon rise? The gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise in opposition to the Prenatal Non-Discrimination Act, which is yet another misleading bill that purports to help women when in reality it takes away their freedom to control their own reproductive health. Mr. Speaker, we should be talking about jobs, but instead, instead we're spending time on this divisive issue. We can all agree that women should not choose to terminate a pregnancy based solely on gender, but this bill criminalizes a legal procedure and puts doctors in the role of legal and moral arbiter and could give almost anyone who asserts an interest an effective veto over a woman's intimate personal health care decision. This bill is another attempt to limit a woman's ability to make her own decisions about her life and her health. It will restrict the rights of women to obtain a completely legal and constitutionally protected medical procedure. If we want to truly and effectively address the issue of gender selective abortion, a problem much more pervasive in other parts of the world, there are much better ways to do it than making suspects out of women and criminals out of doctors. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back. For what pur purpose does the gentlewoman from Illinois rise? I think it now the gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week, Republicans are bringing to the floor a bill that purports to stop abortions based on sex selection. But it is so broadly written and so clearly unconstitutional that it is obvious that they are really after rolling back the clock and undermining comprehensive health care for women. The bill includes a provision that would allow a woman's husband or parents, by merely alleging that an abortion is because of gender, to seek injunctive relief to prevent the, doc prevent the doctor from performing abortion procedures, sending an incredibly private and personal decision into the courts, and potentially for forcing women against their will or health to go through with a pregnancy. Republicans oppose protections for immigrant women under the Violence Against Women Act. They oppose pay equity and access to contraceptions. But with this bill, they claim to be defenders of women? This today marks the third anniversary of the death of and the murder of Dr. George Tiller of Wichita, Kansas, who performed legal abortions. His motto was trust women. He believed that women, not the government, should make the decisions about their health and their lives. I'm not fooled and American women aren't fooled. This bill is just the latest strike in, by Republicans in the war on women. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Maryland rise? The gentlewoman is recognized without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. From an early age, my parents instilled the importance of obtaining a quality education. They cultivated a love of learning and made it clear how important an education is to success in life. 
They could not have been more right. Higher education is the single biggest determining factor for lifetime earning potential, with those holding a bachelor's degree earning double the yearly salary of someone with a high school diploma. And yet, while the benefits of education are clear for America's families, my Republican colleagues seem deaf to the message. Even as college tuition has increased 28 percent in the last decade, Republicans continue to play partisan and ideological politics that will only ensure that 7 million students across the country will see their interest rates double in July. They're more concerned with gutting health care reform and protecting the wealthiest 2 percent and big oil and corporations than making college more affordable for America's students. And the one-time House Republicans put the student loan issue to a vote. They insisted on slashing critical funding for women and children's preventive health care in exchange. If you're thinking, oh, no, not again, you're right. It's time for my Republican colleagues to recognize that students deserve better. And it's time to take action to ensure that student loan rates don't increase, don't double by July. Actually, time is running out. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from California rise? To address the House for one minute and revise and extend. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's absolutely appalling that in the year 2012, women still make 77 cents for every dollar earned by their male peers. This isn't just an issue of fundamental fairness. With so many women heading households and being the primary breadwinner, it's a matter of economic security for American families. These women face the same financial pressure as any other American. They certainly don't get a 23 percent discount on their rent or mortgage payment, on the groceries they buy, or on the children's shoes they have to replace. We must pass the Paycheck Fairness Act, which the Senate plans to vote on this, uh, next week and the House passed in the last Congress. I ask my Republican friends. Mr. Speaker, why the Republicans are making this a priority instead of why they aren't making this a priority instead of today we're voting on a divisive abortion bill that criminalizes a woman's most private health care decisions. Women do not need yet another attack on their reproductive rights. What they need is economic justice. When will the majority get it? I yield back. What purpose does the gentlewoman from California rise? Without objection. Imagine the shocked faces of daughters and sons all across the country when they open up their July billing statement, add up all the figures, and find it's cheaper to buy a home than pursue their higher education. Come July 1st, Republicans are going to let interest rates on student loans double. At the same time, they're making sure wasteful tax breaks for yacht and private jet owners stay in place. In fact, it's the best way for them to keep the Millionaire's Club an exclusive club for good old boys by blocking the best avenue for success that this country has ever known, a college education. The GOP is turning the aspirations of young Americans into a revenue stream for the wealthy. They're financing reckless tax policies on the hopes and dreams of our children. I urge them to join Democrats in a serious proposal to stop these interest rates from doubling. The next generation is counting on us to act responsibly. For what purpose does the gentleman from Delaware rise? Speaker, at, uh, seek unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of the Food and Drug Administration Reform Act, and in particular, the provisions it contains to address critical drug shortages. Across the country, patients are not getting critical medications they need to battle diseases and stay healthy. This crisis is hitting cancer patients especially hard with serious shortages of chemotherapy drugs. In response to this crisis, I introduced the Drug Shortage Prevention Act with my colleague, Representative Larry Bouchon. I'm pleased that key provisions of this bill are included in the legislation that the House passed last night. These provisions help FDA and the DEA fix some of the regulatory problems that are causing these shortages. This is not a partisan issue. Drug shortages affect all of us. I'm pleased that the Senate bill passed its own version of this legislation last week, and I'm hopeful that both chambers can quickly come together to present a final package for the President's signature. When a family gets hit with a diagnosis like cancer, they have enough things to worry about. Running out of chemotherapy drugs should not be one of them. Thank you. I yield back.
For what purpose does the gentlewoman from California rise? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tomorrow marks the official start of this year's hurricane season. As ranking member of the Subcommittee of Emergency Communications Preparedness and Response that supports the Department of Homeland Security, I'm speaking today to note that broadcasters have demonstrated a continued commitment to local communities in providing critical information during times of disasters. When disasters strike, Americans depend upon their local television and radio stations for access to life-saving information and emergency announcements. Broadcasters' commitment to public service is never more apparent than in the time of a crisis. As we typically see during times of disasters, whether it's a hurricane, flood, fire, tornado, earthquake, or a widespread power outage, broadcasters remain to cover the dangerous situations, and most importantly, they provide vital assistance to those who might need it. During an emergency, broadcasters deliver comprehensive up-to-date warnings and information to those affected areas, which helps victims and also bring comfort to family members who are waiting any kind of information. This issue is very important to all of us. Broadcasters can provide information in a moment's notice when we need it most. I ask my colleagues to join me to commend our local broadcasters for their work, their continued readiness, and the important role that they play in a time of a, an emergency. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from New York rise? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as had just been mentioned by my colleague from California, tomorrow, June 1st, is the official start of the 2012 Atlantic hurricane season, which would potentially mean that bad news for areas across the nation, including folks on Long Island in my congressional district. Last year, Hurricane Irene and the earthquake felt along the East Coast reminded us of the importance of the nation's first responders, specifically the importance of our broadcasters. Emergency plans are only effective if they are able to communicate to the folks in need. They, the fact underscores the importance of our broadcasters. With that in mind, I have constantly supported efforts for both the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Communications Commission to explore the potential benefits of including radio tuners in mobile telephones. Since technology would ensure that folks have an outlet to receive critical information in times of need, I encourage this Congress to act swiftly to consider any and all opportunities that would facilitate communication during emergencies. As we embark on hurricane season, let's take this moment to recognize the importance of broadcasters and all of our first responders that they selfishly provide services in our time of need. With that, I yield back. For what purpose does this gentleman from Florida rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask for unanimous consent that upon adoption, adoption of House Resolution 667, amendments number 4 and 6 printed in the House Report 112-504 be modified to include the amendatory instructions that I have placed at the desk. The, the clerk will report the modifications. Amendatory instructions for amendment number four printed in House Report number 112-504. At the end of Title III, add the following new section. Amendatory instructions for amendment number six printed in House Report number 112-504. At the end of Title IV, page 21 after line two, add the following new section. Is there objection to the modification? Without objection, the amendments, is, the amendments are modified. Uh, the gentleman from, Flor from Florida is recognized. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, by direction of the Committee on Rules, I call up House Resolution 667 and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the resolution. House Calendar Number 133, House Resolution 667, resolved that at any time after the adoption of this resolution, the Speaker may, pursuant to Clause 2B of Rule 18, declare the House resolved into the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of the bill, H.R. 5743 
to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2013 for intelligence and intelligence-related activities of the United States government, the Community Management Account, and the Central Intelligence Agency Retirement and Disability System, and for other purposes. The first reading of the bill shall be dispensed with. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. General debate shall be confined to the bill and shall not exceed one hour equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. After general debate, the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. It shall be in order to consider as an original bill for the purpose of amendment under the five-minute rule the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence now printed in the bill. The committee amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be considered as read. All points of order against the committee amendment in the nature of a substitute are waived. No amendment to the committee amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be in order except those printed in the report of the committee on rules accompanying this resolution. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question in the House or in the Committee of the Whole. All points of order against such amendments are waived. At the conclusion of consideration of the bill for amendment, the Committee shall rise and report the bill to the House with such amendments as may have been adopted. Any member may demand a separate vote in the House on any amendment adopted in the Committee of the Whole to the bill or to the Committee amendment in the nature of a substitute. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill and amendments thereto to final passage without intervening motion except one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 2. At any time after the adoption of this resolution, the Speaker may, pursuant to Clause 2B of Rule 18, declare the House resolved into the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of any bill specified in Section 3 of this resolution. The first reading of each such bill shall be dispensed with. All points of order against consideration of each such bill are waived. General debate on each such bill shall be confined to that bill and shall not exceed one hour equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations. After general debate, each such bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. Points of order against provisions in each such bill for failure to comply with Clause 2 of Rule 21 are waived. During consideration of each such bill for amendment, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole may accord priority and recognition on the basis of whether the member offering an amendment has caused it to be printed in the portion of the Congressional record designated for that purpose in Clause 8 of Rule 18. Amendments so printed shall be considered as read. When the Committee rises and reports any such bill back to the House with a recommendation that the bill do pass, the previous question shall be considered as ordered on that bill and amendments thereto to final passage without intervening motion except one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 3. The bills referred to in Section 2 of this resolution are as follows. A. The bill, H.R. 5854, making appropriations for military construction, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and related agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2013, and for other purposes. B. The bill, H.R. 5855, making appropriations for the Department of Homeland Security for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2013, and for other purposes. C. H.R. 5325, making appropriations for energy and water development and related agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2013, and for other purposes. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for one hour. Mr. Speaker, for purposes of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings, pending which I yield myself as such time as I may consume. During consideration of this resolution, all time yielded is for purposes of debate only. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection. 
Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of this resolution and the four rules that it contains. The rules provide for considerations of cr critically important pieces of legislation meant to fund the federal government, provide for our nation veterans, and protect our national security. With this resolution, I have the distinct honor of bringing three appropriation bills to the House floor under open rules. I'm not sure when the last time is that somebody got to say they're bringing three open rules to the House floor at one time, but I'm proud to be able to do that today. House Res 667 continues the majority's promise to the American people to bring openness, debate, and transparency back to Congress. As a father of three sons in the military and a representative of over 116,000 veterans, I'm particularly happy that this resolution provides an open rule for the bill that funds our nation's veterans programs and meets our military construction needs. We are a veterans a debt that can never be repaid. But the very least we can do is provide them with the benefits they so bravely and selfishly earned. I applaud the Appropriations Committee for the bipartisan way they work to, together to fund these programs for our American heroes and their families. Shouldn't go unnoticed that at a time when it seems difficult to work across the aisle, the Appropriations Committee did just that, and they passed it unanimously. We shouldn't play politics with our veterans, and military construction or Veterans Affair Appropriation Bill doesn't. House Res 667 includes a structured rule for the Intelligence Authorization Act for 2013. This is a bill that authorizes our nation's intelligence and intelligence-related activities. It includes our national intelligence program and military intelligence program. It specifically ensures that nothing in this bill gives the government the authority to conduct any intelligence activity not otherwise already authorized by the U.S. Constitution or our laws. Although this rule may not be an open rule, it is necessarily so. The classified nature of intelligence authorization bill means that we can't debate a lot of the specifics of the underlying bill on the House floor. If we were to debate some of these amendments, we'd put in the impossible position of supporting or opposing amendments based on facts we simply can't discuss for reasons of national security. And still, in our efforts to be open, the Rules Committee managed to allow nine amendments on this debate. Seven of those amendments are Democratic and two are Republican. This, too, is a bipartisan bill, and the Intelligence Committee passed it unanimously, 19 to 0 vote. As the minority views of this bill stated, the stakes are simply too high to make our intelligence programs political. For all these reasons, I'm proud to support this resolution a resolution that provides an extremely open process while balancing the transparency with our national security when it comes to debating our intelligence programs. With that, I encourage my colleagues to vote yes on the rule, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Speaker. And I thank my colleague uh, from uh, Florida, my friend, uh, for yielding me the customary 30 minutes. Departing for the moment at hand, uh, Mr. Speaker, just to identify uh, that today the bipartisan Foster uh, Youth uh, uh, Program uh, has on the hill uh, with many of us um, uh, foster care youth uh, from around this nation. This bill directly affects their lives. I have the good fortune of having a constituent uh, Breon Callis uh, and a uh, Washington, D.C. Um, uh, youth, uh, Goldie uh, Brown, um, uh, following me today, and I hope they hear my remarks and understand uh, the importance to theirs and all children in America's future. The rule provides for consideration of four bills, the Intelligence Authorization, Energy and Water Appropriations, Homeland Security Appropriations, and Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Appropriations. While I agree with my colleague, um, uh, Mr. Nugent, uh, that it is important that this is uh, customarily an open process, and I commend my Republican colleagues uh, in that regard, 
I do, as I did in the Rules Committee, and he was there last evening, object to the significant number of amendments uh, that were not allowed, and I'm sure there are members that will be present uh, to speak to them. Once again, we're looking at broken Republican promises on spending levels. Once again, we're shortchanging our future for the selfish demands of today. And once again, we are missing the opportunity to fully invest in our nation. The choices made in these bills make no sense to me, Mr. Speaker. Nuclear weapons instead of nonproliferation. Fossil fuels instead of renewable energy. Divisive abortion provisions instead of bipartisan agreement on homeland security. It's almost as if Republicans enjoy jabbing a finger in the eye of progress they seem to be doing everything they can to find ways not to grow our economy and create jobs. They do not seem to understand that clinging to fossil fuels and nuclear weapons at the expense of scientific research and energy efficiency will not bring about the kind of progress that this great nation needs. When you cut the Office of Science, when you cut the Advanced Research Projects Agency, and when you cut energy efficiency programs, you harm our ability to invest in the kinds of research that lead to innovation and job creation. Mr. Speaker, I could go through all these bills and point out everywhere the majority have not sufficiently invested in the kinds of programs we need to make progress. It would not be hard because unless it involves military spending or oil, you can be sure uh, that the majorities have cut it under the argument that we are in a fiscal crisis and cannot afford it. But I reject that notion. Mr. Speaker, we can afford to invest in our future, we can afford to create jobs, and we can afford to make the choices now that will reap the benefits for future generations, including those foster children that I mentioned. When President Bush wanted to invade Iraq, Congress spent a trillion dollars. When Republicans wanted to cut taxes for the best off among us in America, Congress spent a trillion dollars. When Congress wanted to fight the war on terror, it appropriated and still does nearly unlimited funding to do so. So this is not about the deficit. The United States does not lack the money to prioritize our future. What we do like is the political willpower and the leadership necessary to set gainful priorities. Spend some now, save more later. What is obvious to middle class and working poor Americans seems entirely lost uh, to my Republican colleagues. While this nation should be benefiting from American ingenuity and products made here in America, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle would rather let our other countries take the lead in scientific advancement, energy efficiency, and clean energy. I'm not just talking about this year's appropriations, Mr. Speaker. I'm talking about the trend under the Republican majority of defunding and deprioritizing the long-term needs of the nation. It's just plain depressing. I know that many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle would prefer to see climate change as a liberal hoax, clean energy as a socialist cabal, and science as a communist plot. But drastic changes are upon this country and indeed upon this world. And our failure to adequately address these uh, challenges now will cost us more in the future. We need energy efficiency, not environmental degradation. We need nuclear nonproliferation, not more nuclear weapons. And we need more investments in science because the next generation, including those foster children that I spoke about of American scientists and innovators, might not be one of the billionaires or millionaires so beloved by my Republican colleagues, but instead might be a desperate entrepreneur in need of a little bit of federal assistance in order to make that great scientific breakthrough. The sacrifices continually demanded 
by the Republican majority in order to provide ever more money for foreign wars and tax cuts for the wealthy, including those of us in Congress, are shortchanging the future of this nation. Rather than work with Democrats to develop bipartisan policies and funding priorities to address the country's challenges, House Republicans are continuing to use the appropriations process for partisan gimmickry and political gamesmanship and pretending by deeming something that ain't going to happen in the Senate as law. I can't tell you what business uh, anti or abortion provisions have in a bill about funding the Department of Homeland Security. I can't tell you why it's more important for the Republicans to target women's health than it is to achieve bipartisan consensus on funding our nation's first responders. And I can't tell you why, Mr. Speaker, we still have to debate this issue when there are so many other pressing concerns before us today. Rather than garner Democrat support for the Homeland Security Bill, Republicans felt the need to poison the legislation with erroneous abortion provisions regarding the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. Rather than take seriously the need to fund disaster relief, and yes, it is true that tomorrow hurricane season begins and we haven't done all or nearly as much as we should have and there were amendments that would have addressed some of the things that we should in fact be prepared to do. Or to do. Rather than take seriously firefighter assistant grants, cyber security efforts that are growing exponentially, the Coast Guard, the Secret Service, and other federal frontline agencies, the majority have cast aside cooperation in the name of what I believe is reckless ideological point scoring. So in the la this latest season of appropriations, Mr. Speaker, we find ourselves yet again cutting from valuable, worthwhile, and essential programs that would create jobs made in America, grow our economy, and ensure prosperity for the millions of Americans still struggling to get by. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman for reserves, the gentleman from Florida. Mr. Speaker, I you know, I'm always at a loss sometimes when I hear certain things, but, you know, this is really about there is no energy policy in America. And we're talking about actually investing in some of the resources that we're standing on today in America to help us become more energy independent, not more energy dependent. Listen, we've seen what Solyndra did. We've seen what some of these ideas have been. While some are very intuitive, or, you know, can lead to some directions that we want to go in. We have resources here today in America that can help us become more energy independent. This appropriation bill actually increases that R&D, that development on clean coal. We have over 300 years of energy just in coal alone. And why would we not look at how we can clean it by utilizing technology to do so. This bill does that. Mr. Speaker, as we move forward, you've got to remember that these are four, of, three of these bills are open for amendment. Now, you know, my good friend on the other side probably remembers back to the 111th Congress when they never had an open rule on appropriations. But this, we have three open rules in one structured rule. So if you don't like something that's contained in any one of those three bills, you have the opportunity to amend it on the floor. You can do that. Mr. Speaker, I continue to reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves, the gentleman from Florida is you recognized. Know, Mr. Speaker, I personally tire of using one bad example on uh, energy creation, Solyndra, uh, which was and is a bad example, and ignoring all of the other um, uh, kinds of investments that we have made in this nation 
uh, that are on about the business of solar and wind. I saw in uh, my congressional district um, uh, this um, uh, weekend a wind uh, program uh, that is the future that is working with the existing in energy infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I yield three minutes uh, to my distinguished good friend, the gentlewoman from California, former member of the Rules Committee, Ms. Matsui. The gentlewoman is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the uh, gentleman from Florida for yielding to me. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, since I was elected to office in 2005, increasing the level of Sacramento's flood protection has been my highest priority. Sacramento is the most at-risk metropolitan area for major flooding as it lies at the confluence of two major rivers, the Sacramento and the American. Sacramento is home to California State Capitol, an international airport, and half a million people. If Sacramento were to flood, the economic damages would range up to $40 billion. We have a lot at risk. We are all well aware of our country's austere budget environment, but it is imperative that Sacramento's basic flood protection needs be met. The federal government must continue to fill its commitment to protect the lives and livelihoods of the capital area of the largest state in the Union. I want to applaud the Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee for including adequate funding for Sacramento's top flood protection projects. For the American River Common Features, the bill includes more than $6 million, which would be for work within the American River watershed, including the American River Common Features General Reevaluation Report. Further design work in support of levee improvements in Natomas and levee improvements on the American River. For the Folsom Dam Joint Federal Project and Dam Rays Project, the bill includes more than $87 million to continue construction on the auxiliary spillway, which will provide greater efficiency in managing flood storage in the Folsom Reservoir and critical dam safety work. Mr. Speaker, each one of the projects is a critical component in improving the flood protection for the entire Sacramento region. Taken together, these projects help us, us to achieve the flood protection levels that families and businesses throughout the Sacramento area need and deserve. In addition, the legislation includes a reserve fund that will allocate over $92.5 million to the Corps for the purpose of funding flood protection projects. Since I remain concerned that the Corps did not request its full capability for Sacramento flood protection projects in their budget, I worked vigorously to secure additional funding for Sacramento's flood protection priorities during the Corps reserve fund competitive process as outlined in this bill. Mr. Speaker, I will continue to push for higher levels of funding to meet our flood protection needs and priorities, not only for the Sacramento area region, but for the country as a whole. Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Florida. Mr. Speaker, I'm more than happy to yield as much time as the gentleman from California, the chairman of the Rules Committee, Mr. Dreyer, may consume. The distinguished chairman is recognized for as much time as he may consume. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my good